risk. Um, we are looking forward to spring and uh, the warmer weather. So anyway, we were just chatting before we uh, got started about obviously about the vaccine vaccinations. I've got my second one tomorrow and various numbers of, uh, of, of just had, Cassie just had a, a, had a second one last week and others, I think Pam, Pamela. <clears throat> So I, I think I mentioned last week on, on another session that I do in the mornings on Sunday on uh, Inside Timer, I was encouraging people to, uh, to stay healthy and get vaccinated. And, and uh, one person uh, reacted strongly to that and felt it was political. <laughs> so sent me an email and I, I said, well, you know, you know, I'm conscious about political stuff, you know, um, you know, kind of have to be careful about, uh, you know, we, it's a diverse community in, in a variety of different ways, but I don't think of vaccinations as political, you know, I think of it as public health and public safety. And, and I don't think I'm gonna, you know, hold back from saying, you know, I mean, I respect people if they have religious or other objections, but I want like probably most of us here, I want to see us, um, a critical mass of us getting uh, getting vaccinated so that we you know we can get beyond this ep epidemic this pandemic and uh, so definitely encourage folks to um, to do that and so hope you're all doing well hope we're all <clears throat> healthy and well and uh, if you're new to uh, to these uh, sessions. I just a couple of words of introduction. My name's Hugh Byrne and I'm a, one of the teachers with the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, IMCW, <coughs> community founded by Tara Brach. And I've been involved in IMCW for almost two decades now and I've been teaching for since 2000. And uh, we were part of, um, of uh, part of IMCW, <clears throat> excuse me, we have um, kind of a community in, uh, based in the Tenley Town area of Northwest DC, um, where we have the Center for Mindful Living. Of course, we haven't been meeting in person for, it's a year now, but uh, many of us were, were used to meet in person there and uh, still have many, many offerings um, from the community, from the Center for Mindful Living, and we'll be sharing, sharing things at the end uh, about, about offerings coming up in, you know, in, the, in the days and the weeks, weeks ahead. It's turned into a very vibrant online community since we can't meet in person. And so there's literally, you know, kind of dozens of, of offerings every week from morning meditations to poetry to, to um, the uh, art that, uh, sessions that, um, that Emily leads and yoga and um, just so many, so many other, the storytelling and, um, and many, many different things as well as the, you know, the regular um, meditation classes. So, um, so it's a wonderful to be part of this community and the broader insight meditation community. And what we've been doing for the Sunday morning sessions um, last few weeks is we've, you know, I, I was beginning with a talk, but sometimes it could get a little bit long and, you know, the session, the, the time could get a little tight. So what we've been doing is we've been beginning with a meditation. And I think a, a lot of people appreciate that. It allows us, you know, from the very start to kind of drop down, drop out of our heads as it were out of our thinking mode and you know all the ways we plan and you know things that are great but not necessarily a good place to always spend our time in our thoughts so um, taking the opportunity at the beginning of the session to uh, to have a, a sit for maybe about 20 minutes or so today you know, I, I think a nice place to begin is with uh, Martha Postlethwaite's poem, which you know probably most of you have been familiar with. I, I share it quite a bit, 
but it's very short, but it really kind of brings me brings me back, as Leonard Cohen would say, to my duties. He would share that at the beginning of the concert, he'd begin with his song, uh, A Bird on the Wire. You know, like a bird on a wire, like a drunk in a midnight choir, I've tried in my way to be free. And he said that song brings him back to his, brought him back to his duties. The poem, um, The Clearing, kind of brings me back to, okay, yeah, yeah, this is what, this is why we're doing what we're doing. She says, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is yours alone to sing falls into your open cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. So for me, that kind of sense of you know, creating a space, creating a clearing in the dense forest of our lives. That metaphor of the dense forest, I find a really powerful one of, you know, speaking to our, the ways that we can get caught up in the kind of the responsibilities and the activities and the to-do lists and the tangles of our lives and to, to actually consciously create the space and then just, you know, essentially just wait, just sit open to what's arising in the body and the heart and the mind with a kind and non-judging awareness, with a kind of an open-hearted sense of receptivity. And then just see what arises out of the, you know, out of the space, out of the clearing. So, you know, I invite you to find a posture where you can create a clearing, where you can just be present for what's arising. So sitting in a way that's comfortable, rela relaxed. <clears throat> if you like to, you can close your eyes, let your attention come inward. And just taking your seat you know, imagine the kind of the archetype of the Buddha sitting under the tree, the tree of enlightenment, consciously, you know, embodying a sense of, of dignity, of presence, feeling your body, letting your attention come down into the body, come out, out of the, the thinking mode, planning mode. Just feeling the body here, <clears throat> feeling the weight of the body pressing down on your thighs and on your buttocks. Sense of solidity. Let the chest be open so you can breathe in a comfortable, relaxed way. Invite the shoulders to relax. Let the hands rest comfortably in the lap or on your, on your knees, on your thighs. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> you might connect with your breathing. The breath is a it's a wonderful barometer to, to sense how we're doing, how we're feeling. You know, when we're stressed or anxious or worried, the breath tends to be tight and short. And when we're relaxed, we, the breath tends to be deeper, calmer. So just notice how your breathing is and you might consciously invite it to deepen as a way of helping you relax and settle into being here. <clears throat> Taking a nice deep in breath, filling the lungs, filling the chest, 
and relaxing, releasing on the out breath. Imagine you're releasing any tensions, any stresses you're, you might be holding as you breathe out. Filling the lungs as you breathe in and letting go, releasing as you breathe out. <clears throat> Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. And letting yourself settle into being here. and letting the breath settle back into its natural rhythm whenever, whenever you feel comfortable. And remember, you can always come back to the breath if you're feeling tight or strength or stressed or tense in any way, or you're dealing with a difficult emotion or mind state, and consciously in, invite a couple of longer, deeper breaths to help you settle again. You might invite a smile to your face, another way of helping helping you arrive and settle, helping you relax into being here. And if it's helpful, you can just bring to mind, bring to into your heart a loved one or somebody who easily makes you feel happy or joyful or peaceful. Letting a smile activate the muscles around the eyes and around your mouth. Just the inviting of a smile sends a, a message to our, <clears throat> to our brain and to our nervous system that we can, we can relax, we can be at ease. You might invite the smile down into the body, into the heart area. You can let the smile be a, an expression of how you want to and choose to meet whatever's present right now, whatever's coming up. See if you can meet it with the attitude, with the expression of a of a smile. Notice, does, does a smile help you meet a difficult feeling or emotion with a bit more space, perhaps a little more openness? You might be curious about that. <clears throat> the smile can be another re resource that we can come back to if we're experiencing some difficulty. Consciously invite the smile.
just opening to what's present for you in the body, in the heart, in the mind. Maybe the Rumi's image of guests coming to visit might be a helpful one to just help you make space for whatever you're experiencing right now. Welcoming the guests, as he says. Whatever you're experiencing, bodily feelings, emotion, mood, mind states, thoughts. See if you can just bring a kind and non-judging awareness to, to what's here. Letting them come, letting them be, letting them go. Experiencing the impermanence of all of these states, all of these experiences. Coming, staying for a while, and passing. <clears throat> you can see our task as really just being to, to welcome and allow whatever's here, make space for what's here. And may find that in the making space, things change. There's something that might have been experienced as difficult, may soften, become a little easier to, to hold and be with, with this attitude of, of acceptance, kindness. as a way of helping ground the attention, helping you be here now. It can be useful to have a focus for attention. One of the most commonly used and for many, and one of the most helpful focuses is our own breathing. As the breath's always available to us, we can always come back to the breath. It's also a, can be, a, as I mentioned, a kind of barometer of our state of mind and state of being. So we can use the breath as, a, as an anchor for our attention, just aware of breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in. Breathing out, it's meeting the breath as it is without doing anything with it. But just letting it be a, a focus for attention, kind of a ground for our attention, if that's helpful. <clears throat>
And then when the mind goes off as it will at times, you can just kindly and gently let the attention come back. So we're cultivating this present moment attention to our experience. Using an object like the breath can be a helpful way of doing that. And we're doing it in a way that is welcoming and allowing of, of whatever our experience is. So with kindness and with spaciousness, if we can, just letting everything come and go. And notice what your attitude is towards your experience right now. Is it one of kindness, acceptance? Or is it one of resisting something or pushing something away? <clears throat> if you notice there is resistance, maybe there's tension in the belly or a tightening of the muscles. or disliking something in your experience. See if you can hold that too with kindness, make space for it. <clears throat> Can this moment be a moment of peace, a moment of acceptance? As Dorothy Hunt says, peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. <clears throat> Peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. And noticing where your attention is right now. Coming back <clears throat> anytime you notice the mind is caught up in stories, plans, memories. Just simply notice that, recognize that you know, when you notice you're really waking up out of the story and you're back in the present, back here. You can just gently incline the mind back to the body and the breath. <clears throat> and 
in this way we we train the mind train the heart to be here to be here in a particular way with kindness with acceptance without judgment You might just connect too with just all of us here together, practicing together, here in community, how we support each other in our practice. Perhaps wishing well to all who are here together in all our different places. You might just take a moment to appreciate yourself for taking this time, creating the clearing in the dense forest of our lives to pause and bring the attention inward, just open to what's present, what's alive right now. And to practice, you know, what the Buddha talked about as abandoning the unskillful through this open, kind, receptive awareness to see where we might be holding on, we might be clinging to something, wanting things to be a certain way or resisting certain experiences. And just in the in the meditation, being able to see, maybe see patterns that don't support us, <clears throat> that we might let go of. And how we can also cultivate the good, cultivate qualities of mindfulness and compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, that help us to to be here and live more wisely, more kindly, more skillfully. And in this way to, to really train our hearts and our minds. To live in a way that really expresses our deepest values and deepest caring for ourselves and our world. <clears throat> I'll share Dorna Markova's poem, I Will Not Die an Unlived Life. I will not die an unlived life. I will not live in fear of falling or catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days, to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid, more accessible, to loosen my heart until it becomes a wing, a torch, a promise. 
I choose to risk my significance, to live so that which came to me as seed goes to the next as blossom, and that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. I choose to risk my significance, to live so that which came to me as seed goes to the next as blossom, and that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. So taking your time, come back into the, the visual realm, into the back into our group together. <clears throat> <coughs> so again, if anyone joined us during the meditation, welcome to you. We've, uh, it's lovely to be together. More and more of us from outside of our area as well. It's nice to see and one of the silver linings of this cloud that we've been living under for the last year that we can be together in this way and um, you know just to be able to see most of the faces of um, you know as we're together it's uh, it's a very it, a very rich experience even though we're not physically together um, and something that I'm I feel very very grateful for so and very good to be be together today. I want to share a few reflections today, um, kind of on the si similar theme to the meditation. And the theme of this re talk reflection is an appropriate response, an appropriate response. Um, so the so what I'll be talking about is essentially is cultivating a, an appropriate response. And what I, I begin with, it's a lovely dog you have there, Rachel, in Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> um, welcome to all of the uh, non-humans as well as, as, as all of us humans, many, many cats and some dogs. And sure some other pets too. So one of the key insights of spiritual life and spiritual practice for me, and maybe for many of us, is that while we can't control much of what happens to us, or we only have a limited amount of control about what happens to us, like, you know, whether we get sick or we, whether we get older or, you know, things that happen to us, you know, whether we lose our job or, you know, you know, fall over when we're on the ice we know when we go outside you know there's a lot you know with the things that we can control we can do the best we can you know to be as healthy and safe and all of those things but life will will bring things up that you know that we don't have much or any control over and part of our practice an important part of our practice is to kind of engage with what we can't control, you know, particularly sickness, aging and death, with what we can control, which is how we meet our experience. And so we can't control a lot about, there's a lot about life that we can't, can't control or only have limited control over. But what we do have control over, what we can, you know, influence and impact is how we meet our experience. You know, how we respond to what the world presents to us, you know, what, what life presents to us, and how we meet our own feelings, our own emotions, what we create from inside, you know, in 
just using that inside outside you know it's relatively useful but our own emotions our own feelings our own bodily experiences we can choose how we 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 respond to our experience this is what um the great psychologist and writer um victor frankl spoke about when he he, he talked about the last of the of the human freedoms the freedom to determine how we respond to our circumstances, our attitude to what we're experiencing. And he was speaking from, you know, the most horrific of, of, of circumstances, you know, surviving the Nazi uh, concentration camp of Auschwitz. And he said in one of his best known sayings, he, um, he said they could take everything from us, but the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose our own, one's own way. That, you know, nobody can take from us the last of the human, you know, the, the freedom to determine how we meet our experience. You know, somebody, you know, people could put us in prison, they could, you know, try to control what we did, but they can't, ultimately nobody can control how we choose to meet our experience. I mean, we could choose to give that up. You know, we could say, oh, there's nothing I can do about this. But we actually have this freedom to meet our experience. And it's, it's one of the most, you know, powerful things we have in this life. I think it's part, you know, one of the most powerful parts of, of this being human is of having choice you know choosing how we respond now we don't choose everything we can't you know we don't choose of you know if we could choose we might live forever we might not but we might choose that but we don't have that freedom that's not a choice we have but we do have a choice about how we respond to our experience and really our happiness and our well-being you could say rest on the knife edge of how we respond to our experience. Um, you know, we tend to think that, let's say, if a sad things, a thing happens, that sadness is just the way it is. You know, there is this, you know, it's as though sadness was a, you know, was a, a solid thing in itself. Um, you know, we lose, we lose a loved one or a relationship comes to an end, we kind of think of that as a solid thing. Oh, that's sad. You know, that's a loss, that's sad. But when something that we might call sad or painful happens, you know, like losing a loved one or a relationship ending, when this arises, it's a very different experience if we meet it with a lot of negative thoughts. For example, I'll never be happy again you know, after losing this relation, I'll never, or I'll never have another relationship, I'll never be happy again. Or if we believe now life has lost all of its meaning, you know, we could choose, that's a response. And, we, and the difference between that and meeting the same experience, but with a quality, some open heartedness, with some quality of acceptance, of actually saying, yeah, this is sad. This is painful, but making space as we do in the meditation for the sadness. If sadness is present and meeting it with kindness, with acceptance, perhaps with curiosity, it's a very different experience than if we meet it with resistance. Oh, this shouldn't be happening or nothing's ever going to change or my life is so, you know, so sad you know we we in the in the first example that where we bring that resistance in that the story in you know i speak I've spoken other times about it as <clears throat> it's like a second arrow that we're adding or a third arrow you know we may be judging ourselves for having that resistance you know and then we can add a third arrow or fourth arrow <clears throat> The difference between that and meeting our experience, uh, you know, open-heartedly, wholeheartedly, 
is is a really fundamental difference and it actually changes the experience you know so we we could say in either situation we have the reality that we've lost someone or lost something it's the same experience but when we meet it open-heartedly it becomes a very a very different experience than when met with resistance <clears throat> What we're calling the sadness and treating as though it were like a permanent thing or a solid thing actually isn't permanent or solid. It is entirely dependent on how we meet the experience. And this is what in Buddhism is spoken about as dependent origination or dependent arising that nothing has an independent existence. It's always conditioned and affected by how we meet our experience. This is one of the deepest of the Buddhist teachings of dependent origination. We transform our experience by how we meet it. You know, I mean, by meeting that quote, sad experience, with acceptance and with kindness, it becomes a different experience. It's transformed, it's changed. Very different from when we meet it with rejection or with judgment or with anger or with some, some way where we're resisting the experience. <clears throat> so we transform our experience by how we meet it. So we can choose to limit our suffering by choosing not to add a second or third arrow to the experience. So this is within the realm of our, of the choices we make, of, of our choice. There's a well-known um, Zen koan you know, these paradoxical experience, you know, these paradoxical statements like, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping, you know, which you kind of contemplate and cogitate and try to solve. And they're only really solved when you let go of trying to solve them. You know, that, that, that kind of the paradox of the wisdom, the understanding comes from a, from a sense of letting go. This is one, um, a monk asking a teacher, Yun Men, what are the teachings of a whole lifetime? What are the teachings? What are the lessons of a whole lifetime of teaching? You know, the teacher is asked. And Yun Men says, an appropriate response, an appropriate response. You know, he's saying all of the teachings really come down to an appropriate response how we respond to our experience moment to moment. You can say, you could say that all of spiritual life, all of spiritual practice comes down to an appropriate response. How am I meeting this moment? How am I meeting this experience? When I say this experience, I mean this one right now. You know, how are you meeting this moment? You know, just be curious, be interested in, in your experience. There's nothing wrong if you were to kind of, you, you might be in your mind saying, oh, you know, I've heard this before, you know, I, you know, uh, oh, I know this, you know. Well, that would be just something to be interested in as well. You know, be curious about it. What we're inviting is this quality of just, okay, what is it like right now? You know, how does my body feel? What's going on in my mind? You know, what emotions or moods are present, you know, that, that an appropriate response, what is an appropriate response um, in this moment? And it's always in this moment, because an appropriate response to what happened yesterday is not particularly meaningful. It could be meaningful in the sense of like, oh, I should learn from, I could have done things differently. Maybe I could have had a different appropriate response then, but the appropriateness is always really about 
you know, it's about the immediacy, it's about what, what's here. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you know, it comes up in meditation where, you know, we've all heard teachers saying, you know, when, when the mind wanders, you know, you get caught up in planning or memories. Just bring your attention back to your body, to your breath, to this moment. That's a helpful instruction. But even that is only a guideline. You know, there's not, it's not supposed to be a rule that you always do this. You know, any of the instructions are only at best guidelines. They're pointers, they're suggestions, you know, and they can be very helpful guidelines and suggestions, but they're not absolutes. You know, even, even the, the things that seem more absolute don't kill, don't harm living beings. Um, you know, there may be situations where, you know, to save your life, you might need to harm a living being, you know, it's not an absolute, you know, um, you know, that would be a very strong, you know, precept in Buddhism and many other traditions as well. But even then, you know, there may be situations where, you know, it, it's justified and it's appropriate. It's an appropriate response. And each one of us has to <clears throat> determine. It may not, one person's sense of what's appropriate might be different from another's. So for example, you know, of whether one, one eats meat, you know, in some way is, com, what's the word, um, complicit or another word, um, you know, um, yeah, I mean, complicit in some way in the killing of an animal. You know, some many people would say, no, I, you know, I can't, you know, I can't do this, that, or I don't want to be, I don't want to be complicit in, in harming a living being. Other people would say, you know, I don't have that same, same view maybe, or perhaps I need protein, you know, that I can only get, you know, through eating animal um, protein. Um, and, and come to a different view. You know, it's not, you know, some people may hold a view very strongly, but ultimately I can't say your view is wrong on that or my view is wrong or right, you know. Um, we each have to determine what is appropriate and really it's appropriate for, for, for us, you know. I'm, I'm saying, you know, this is what, what is an appropriate response for me. <clears throat> so even, even precepts have to be related to in the way of, you know, what is the situation? What is this, you know, what is this moment asking of me? So the art of meditation, you could say the art of mindfulness is discerning what is an appropriate response which always depends on the situation, on the context, on the circumstances. An appropriate response is always appropriate to these circumstances. You know, for another set of circumstances, it might be a different response. So yesterday, meditating, you might, feel, might have felt some pain or discomfort, and you might have sat with the pain and said, okay, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling tingling or sharp squeezing. Okay, I'm gonna sit with it. I'm gonna stay with it. And you might have rode, ridden the waves of the experience. And that might've been the appropriate response. Today, you might be sitting and have a very similar, <coughs> excuse me, have a very similar feeling of pain or discomfort, but let's say you're now feeling tired, you don't have a lot of energy, and it's really hard to, to, to stay with the experience. An appropriate response might be to move from a cushion to a chair, it might be to lie down, it might even be to go take a walk, because you know, you just, you're just too tired to really feel that you can be present right now. So the appropriate response yesterday may be a very different one from today and may be different from tomorrow. So what is appropriate will always be situational. 
You know, it doesn't mean there aren't things, strong precepts and guidelines to, to help inform our choices, but still it comes back down to this moment, this situation, this experience. And how we respond determines our happiness and our well being. So, our appropriate response determines whether, you know, it determines our suffering, you know, if we respond in an unwise way, or it can determine our happiness and our freedom if we choose wisely. When we respond to any situation, we can ask ourselves the question, does this thought or pattern of thinking, or does this, these, do these words or this action lead to happiness or do they lead to suffering? You know, if you spend a lot of time worrying about the future, anxious, you know, oh, this might happen, no, but what if this happens? You know, you're kind of in that kind of anxious mode. You can ask yourself, is that a helpful, is it a beneficial response? Is it an appropriate response? Or does it lead you to being more, lead, lead, lead you to be more anxious? You know, are you just throwing fuel on an already raging fire by kind of being anxious and then getting more anxious by having more anxious thoughts? And, you know, it kind of builds, it snowballs. Perhaps in that situation, <clears throat> an appropriate response would be to kind of say, okay, an anxious thought, notice that, let it go, come back to the body, come back to the breath, let it go when they, an anxious thought comes up, notice it, you know, thank that part of your consciousness for trying to look after you, say, I'm, I'm doing okay now, let it go, come back to the body with kindness, with compassion. So, Choosing what's, what's going to lead to greater well-being, greater happiness. So our practice, really, or much of our practice is to bring awareness to our experience in a non-judging way and to respond wisely and compassionately in this moment. What is an appropriate response right now? So an appropriate response, we can say, is a wise and compassionate response. You know, we don't always know what the appropriate response is. You know, should I quit my job? You know, if you're in a situation, probably most of us at some time in our life have been in a situation where I'm not really happy in, in, in my job, but maybe it's risky. You know, you know, if I were to give up my, you know, quit my job, Maybe there isn't something I can move into. And so it's not always clear. So an appropriate response may call on us to just sit in the clearing, you know, and, and just kind of wait for, you know, for until the song that is alo ours alone to sing falls into our, our open cupped hands, you know, as Martha Possel puts it. You know, sometimes it's to sit with it. Sometimes it might be to make a leap into uncertainty and say, I really don't know, but I'm going to take a risk. You know, I'm going to take a risk and I'm going to, and then maybe, maybe it's the wrong choice or maybe it wasn't the best choice. And, and, and yet we can learn from that experience. You know, we can learn for the, from the future and we can grow from choices that may not be the best choices, you know. So it's something really to explore, to cultivate, kind of to, um, to pay attention to, you know, what is an appropriate response. I think I shared a, my own story of back in the 90s, um, you know, Having, I'm, you know, I've been practicing meditation for about 10 years and been doing quite a lot of retreats and things. And my main teacher at the time said to me, you know, you might think about teaching meditation. Didn't give me a lot of guidelines on it. 
just said, oh, you're in Washington, Tara Brock's kind of there. Maybe you might connect with her. And I did a few years later, but I didn't, I, I was still working in the kind of social justice and human rights area and kind of thought to myself, oh, maybe I, should I make a shift and kind of move into this meditation teaching, try and, try, you know, try and see if I could do that as a livelihood. And I think I may, I may have shared the story of I, I, I thought I'd, I'd make the uh, millennium a, a time to make a change, you know. And so, you know, I thought that Y2K thing, you know, if you remember that from 20 years ago of, of you know, this is going to be a big change. But I, I wanted to use that time as a, maybe a, a time to draw a line in my own life of, you know, from kind of shifting from, I decided to shift from the kind of the social justice work in a kind of formal working way into this kind of dharma, you know, more formally kind of moving into a dharma teaching role. And so I, I, uh, I quit my job in December of 1999 and I asked myself, where do I want to be, you know, when 1999 turns into 2000 and so I said, I think I'd like to be under the Bodhi tree where the Buddha was enlightened, you know, as a kind of a marker of that, you know, change. And I went there and, and spent a month there in northern India in Bodh Gaya, you know, under the, not the whole time under the tree, but I was under the tree when it made that, that turn to, to 2000. And when I look back on that, I feel that it was it was a good thing to do and a good time to do it. You know, I could have done it at another time. I could have done it on the 3rd of September, 2002, for example, you know, or whatever. I didn't, there's nothing sacrosanct about those dates, you know, but it was a way of just kind of drawing a line that was a meaningful one to me at the time and making what was more important was the shift in my own life. And so, you know, that felt to me that at the time it was a, a choice I made that did feel like an appropriate response. It felt like a good choice to make, a, a good time to make it in my life. And probably like many of you, not every choice I've made was an appropriate response <laughs> in my life, you know, I made choices that, uh, oh, oh, you know, that wasn't maybe the wisest thing to do. Um, so, um, I, I share this, um, just this kind of the reflection on a, an appropriate response, um, because for me, it really does speak, it really does get to the heart of these teachings and these practices of how do I meet this moment? What is an appropriate response in this moment? And it's always going to be, as I've said, it's always going to kind of rest on the knife edge of the present moment. You know, it's not five minutes ago. It's not tomorrow. It's right now. What is the choice for now? And in five minutes from now, it might be a different choice, you know, and so we, we keep coming back to the sense of appropriate, wise, skillful, compassionate. What's, what's wise right now? And I think what's rise, wise right now is to stop and pass the, uh, the baton over to Emily to lead us in some movement if you're ready um, to do that, Emily. And uh, then we'll come back and do some sharing. And thank you, Emily. So let me invite you all to stand up and find your feet. Start swaying from side to side. You might even take a moment to rise up on your toes and come down and maybe balance on your heels and calm down. And then open up to the space around you, just swaying from side to side in your own pace with your own body, feeling the energy against your skin. And then slow it down, slowing down, becoming very attentive. Bring your arms alongside your body, turn your palms up 
and reach up, grasping your left wrist with your right hand. Inhale, lift up. Exhale, tilt over to the left. Reaching out from the base of your hip through your fingertips. And inhale back to center. Switch hands. Inhale, reaching up again. Exhale, tilt. Short breath in and reaching up again. Exhale, soften. And then inhale back up. Allow your arms to float down. And then bring up your arms again into cactus pose. And we'll move just one time to the right, inhaling in neutral. Exhale to one side, back to center. And to the other, back to center. And then drop your hands. Raise them. Drop your hands and raise them, and drop, and raise. Reaching up again, bring your hands to prayer position and then bring them down to your heart, turning out to all of us here, the kindness and compassion, turn your hands down. And when you're ready, We'll exhale with a whoosh. So I'll show. Whoosh. Yeah, good. One more time. Hands up above, down to your heart center, out to all of us, down, and whoosh. Float your arms down. Bring your hands to the back of your waist so we can open up our chest, inhaling, lifting up, and then draw your hands away from your body, engaging your shoulder blades, and release. Inhale, lift your chest and head, and bring your arms away from your body, and release. Last time, hands at your waist, lifting your chest and head. Bring your arms away from your body and release. Shake it out. Do your own dance in whatever way you might want to do, rolling your shoulders or rolling them the other way. And our last movement is to come into a gentle forward bend, placing your hands above your knees. Inhale, reaching up and out. Exhale, lower, allowing the pull of gravity to draw your shoulders down and your head and your upper back, lowering to wherever you are comfortable. Taking an inhale here, you could exhale with a sigh. Huh. Inhaling one more exhale. <sighs> and then slowly bring your hands back to your knees. Press on your feet, bringing your hands to heart center, release to the sky. Bring energy to all of us and to the earth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Lovely. Thank you. We are going to um, do some sharing in small, uh, in some small groups um, and uh, just invite you um, in the sharing, you know, have it be a, a mindfulness practice, um, being groups of, I think, four and 
or maybe it's somewhat maybe three um just take some time to share each person in turn um just what's alive for you as we practice today um you know what are the what are the gifts and what are the challenges you're experiencing and um you know anything that came up for you in the in the meditation or the talk or the movement and uh, we'll come back um dan if we could in uh, in 12 minutes and if you choose not to go into the group we can just just practice quietly um in the main room so uh are we ready to um to do the breakout groups So welcome back everyone. Um, please uh, feel free if you'd like to, to use the chat to share anything, any responses you might have or any gratitude you might have for, for uh, folks that you were in the group with, if you're in a, in a small group. And um, again, maybe just check with you if anyone has um, anything you'd like to share or any question, we we'll take a couple of minutes to do that and then we'll have a, a final meditation before announcements and finishing up. Um, just if uh, any, any um, insights or any questions anyone might have. Um, everyone doing okay? Yeah. Hugh, can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, who, who is speaking? Uh, my name is Malika. I'm, Hi, Malika. I'm waving. Um, yeah. Just two two things. One, kind of unrelated. I was also in Boat Gaia um, in 1999 on New Year's Eve night. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> I was there for 10 days. Um, I followed the Dalai Lama kind of around. I was a bit of a groupie, and I was in Boat Gaia for 10 days while he was teaching. Oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah. And I have a picture of me, me and some Tibetan monks and some friends meditating New Year's Eve night by one of the temples that they had. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was supposed to, he was supposed to come, but for security reasons, he didn't, as I recall, at least for the New Year's, for the, for that occasion. I know he was supposed to come, but. Uh, yeah. It may have been that night he wasn't there, but he was definitely there for part of the time that I was yeah. there. Cause I remember, yeah. you know, watching him. Um, but so that I just need to, I just thought oh, that was kind of such a, very, oh, such a small world. Um, yeah, a small but world. I, I think to your, to your earlier point about appropriate response, I think it is, I, I always find myself so challenged. Like I completely 100% get that, buy it, believe it, have experiences that prove that. But it's also, I think, so easy in our world to, to really have the anger or have anger just rise up and like eclipse the appropriate response um, when we're looking at injustice and racism and sexism and any, I mean, just all of the isms and all of the ugliness um, and just how easy it is to blame other people, no matter, no matter how correct you know the appropriate responses for your own well being. And again, I know it is so perfect for my well-being when I can be in that space but I also find it very I find my mind so easily shifting into anger and blame yeah at people who make life really hard for marginalized people yeah so thank you yeah that's so it's so so powerful and so so important um you know, just recognizing how how powerful the um, the pull is really to to respond, and it has it has wisdom in it, 
And I think it has compassion in it. You know, when we do, you know, if we do get into anger or blame, you know, it actually has a motivation of caring. We're caring about those who are suffering. Um, and the anger may have a sense of wanting to act. It has a lot of energy of acting about it. But the truth is, and I think you'd kind of probably agree to this as well. The truth is that if it isn't, if we don't respond skillfully to those arising emotions, then they easily get it go in directions that even though they have good motivations to them actually have really harmful responses you know so if we just kind of lash out you know in our anger or we you know treat people as though you know they're the worst person in the world and we have to you know anything that could we do to them is okay you know then we just create further division and separation and so I, I, you know, the way I think of it is like honoring those energies that are there, but recognizing that we can, we can train our hearts and we can train our minds and that there are more skillful responses where we, you know, we, we kind of use those energies, but in a, a direct direction that it doesn't cause harm and doesn't cause separation. And so um, I think it, it calls for a lot of self-compassion, you know, just to recognize that, you know, when it's hard, it really is hard, you know, and to cultivate kindness to ourselves, self-compassion. So it, I think of it as really a training, you know, not that we're kind of judging ourselves and, oh, I failed at compassion. You know, I wasn't compassionate enough or I failed at an appropriate response. I responded angrily. But to hold that with compassion and know that we're all works in progress. You know, none of us is the Buddha, you know, or Jesus or whoever we might kind of hold out as avatars of, of wisdom and compassion. We're all on a journey, I think. And so the more compassion we can bring in for our, towards ourselves and to others, then we can we can work with those energies. And I, I really hear what you're saying about how hard it can be. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking just time-wise, um, we might finish with a, a relatively short meditation. This will just be five or seven minutes. So um, just inviting you again to let the attention come inward kind of making, consciously making a shift out of the kind of thinking mode, the discursive mode, and just into feeling the body here. You could let your eyes close, let your attention come inward, drop down into the body. You might take a few deeper breaths to help you Settle, relax. And opening to what's present right now in the body, the heart and the mind. This moment, just as it is, this moment without judgment. inviting a response of being present to whatever whatever we're experiencing making space for it 
making space for what's here right now in the body, the mind, the heart. If we are feeling discomfort, pain or, or suffering, you know, an, an appropriate response, a helpful response, a compassionate response can be as simple as putting a hand on your heart and kind of with that gesture, expressing a quality of compassion towards yourself, an expression of compassion towards yourself. I care about this suffering, holding your experience with kindness. And when we're focused on, on what's wrong or what we're lacking or what we need, can be a, an appropriate response, a compassionate response to just reflect on what we have, you know, to be grateful for what we have. And that can be a powerful shifting of our attention from or what we lack or what we don't have to, to what we have. <clears throat> At times, loving kindness can be an appropriate response. You know, if we think of somebody who's doing harmful things in the world, you know, maybe someone we know or someone in the political world, can be an appropriate response to think of them as, you know, suffering beings themselves. Maybe think of them as a child who you know, wanted to be loved and cared for, cared for, maybe didn't get the love they needed and, and kind of taking things out on the world. In these final few minutes of the meditation, you, you might breathe in kindness for yourself. Just on the in-breath, inviting a quality of kindness and care towards yourself, towards whatever difficulties or challenges you might be facing right now. Breathing in compassion and breathing out kindness, compassion towards someone who's suffering right now. And maybe a whole group of people who are suffering in the pandemic. You know, those who've lost loved ones, those who've lost, lost their jobs or their businesses, business. Just letting your heart go out, your kindness, compassion go out towards someone or people who are suffering. Breathing in compassion for yourself. Breathing out compassion for, for another or others. <clears throat>
this poem from Mary Oliver, Praying. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. May our practice together today help in whatever ways alleviate the, the suffering of the world. May these practices help us open our hearts so that we can go back into our lives with more compassion, more kindness, more insight. And as a serenity prayer, invites us to change what we can change, accept what we can't change, and uh, to have the discernment to be able to tell the difference, know the difference. <clears throat> So we'll finish off with some announcements um, about upcoming um, activities and programs. I'll just share a couple of things. Well, one thing I have coming up and I'm gonna put this in the chat box as um, I shared in uh, other um, earlier weeks. I'm, I'm teaching a, a class on the Four Noble Truths, which is the really the central teaching of the Buddha on suffering and the end of suffering. The Buddha said, gave an analogy or a simile um, of a, an elephant's put, footprint. He said, just as all of the footprints of all of the, the animals in the forest fit inside the footprint of an elephant, so all of the teachings fit inside the teachings of these Four Noble Truths about suffering and the end of suffering. So if you're interested in kind of diving in a little bit deeper than we're able to go in the time we have, you know, in these Sunday classes into these core teachings of the Four Noble Truths, um, I have a six week class beginning on April 19th and going through May 24th, six Mondays. And uh, I've put the link to the IMCW um, website um, where you can register for that if you'd like to. Um, I'm really looking forward to it and uh, it'd be you know, great if you feel inclined to, to join us. I'll be, I'll be doing it online, of course. And then uh, just to mention um, maybe more for people who are brand new to these um, the practices and these classes, um, there's no cost for the class, but you're invited if you're able and inclined to give dana or generosity, which is the way the teachings have come down through 2,500 years. And these, it's a practice that we keep going, even though it's in a very different kind of culture um, and society than the time of, at the time of the Buddha, but um, the uh, it's what I rely on for you know considerable extent for my uh, livelihood, and I appreciate really great, and I'm grateful for for the support.